Hola a todos. ¿Nos ven? Hey everyone, this is Maria. I'm sorry about all the techy problems, but let's move forward. I'm here with our man, Rodney Habib. Oh my God, Rodney, I'm so excited for this. Really, I'm so excited that all the technical stuff didn't work. Okay, so. Yeah, we, had a lot, we definitely had a lot of tech problems, you and I, and that, and a lot of it was Facebook. So for uh, you know, for all the the Facebook uh, owners out there who watch a lot of my Facebook lives, you got to make these devices easier. Literally, when I'm like this and you're like this, it doesn't work. And I know we were wasting a lot of people's time for like 15 minutes. So I apologize out there. And I got a lot to say when I meet up with the Facebook team in the future. Thank you, Rodney, for being here, for making room for this interview. I know you're a really, really busy man and busy person and busy pet parents. So we're going to take the most out of this of this conversation. So people, for, for you who don't know me, this is Maria Gargari. I'm an enthusiastic pet parent, and I'm teaching um, pet owners on how to raw feed correctly their dogs through my community, The Happiest Dog, or in Spanish, El Perro Más Feliz. For everyone that speaks in Spanish, todos los que hablan en español, esta entrevista va a ser subtitulada después. Yo les voy a decir. So today I'm so thrilled to and happy to have you here, Rodney. For everyone who doesn't know who Rodney is, who I'm pretty positive is less than 1%. Okay, Rodney Habib is a digital artist, filmmaker, multiple award winning blogger, but mostly and most importantly, he's the founder of the world's largest pet health page, Planet Paws, and foremost most passionate and devoted pet parent who has been researching a lot of dog cancer. And well, basically, Rodney, I, I don't want to take more time. Why don't you give a, a, a little intro about yourself for everyone who doesn't know who you are? Well, yeah. well, first of all, hello to everybody in the Spanish speaking community. So I'm going to, I know that I have a tendency to talk very fast in the English speaking community where people hardly understand me. So I'm going to uh, do my best for, I know a lot of people out there, I love the language, uh, the Spanish language, and I really need to learn it. Um, but basically, I am of the I'm basically of the category of pet owners who say to themselves all the time, if I only knew then what I know now, uh, you know, I'm in that category of pet owners that have made a lot of mistakes uh, with their pets. Um, those pet owners who are up day and night, every day researching, wanting the best for their animal. I'm of that category. And reality is I made a lot of mistakes with my pet and, um, and things that I really haven't forgiven myself for today, Maria. And, I, I truly believe that my art is my therapy. Literally, I take in the whole world as I see it through the scientific community, through researchers. I mix it up in my own brain and I try to give it back to pet parents to make it uh, very digestible for them. But as I always say, more importantly than anything, I'm a, I'm a proud dog dad to three fur babies and that is the most important thing in the world for me. I know, I know, Robbie. So I, I, I would start off with um, telling us, um, like, the answer of a very asked question among, among pet parents and dog parents, that is, why don't dogs live forever, Rodney? Yeah. I know you've made this question to you and to, to everyone before, but why? Why don't they live forever? Yeah, that is, I, I believe that is the ultimate question of every single dog lover on and cat lover of this on this planet. Uh, literally, one day when I die and I meet my maker, the first the question that I'm going to ask for him is that torment of only having these animals for like one eighth of our lifespan. And you know, uh, Maria, for me, it's you know, I did my when I did my TED talk, which was interesting. I titled it "Why Don't Dogs Live Forever," and it was either between that or "Why yeah. Do Dogs Die So Young." And I remember I left it to social media and I asked the people there to decide what that title would be. Um, you know, I, I think today with, with the research that we have and, and, and the technology that we have, we know that there's two main factors for that. One and the most terrible and the most obvious factor is that DNA that they have. I mean, reality is they inherited that from the wolf and we know that wolves don't really live that long. And so the punishment of having that pre-programmed DNA that the good Lord gave them, like, why couldn't they have the DNA of elephants where they could live to be longer right. than we can? 
Um, and so that is the one hurdle that we have to face as pet parents. And then the second hurdle, of course, would be what science is telling us today, which is causing all the diseases, is the environment around us and, of course, the food that we put into the bowl of these animals. So there's a lot of things today that, you know, science is very unclear on, on why are dogs living so short? Why did they used to live so long? And why are they living so short today? And that is literally what I've dedicated my life to figuring out. Right. Um, yeah, that question, I think, will will prevail all of us. But uh, Rodney, uh, you've devoted your last years doing deep research on how can pets live longer and happier lives and healthier lives. So can you tell us more about why and how you started this exciting journey? So for me, I mean, reality is it's my own paranoia and my own anxiety I have for losing love. Uh, like I, I, my dog is actually my very first dog that I ever got in my whole life, which was Sammy. And experiencing that as a, as a 30 year old man, having your very first dog, you know, I say this all the time, that love that you just thinking about it, I get that lump in my throat when I want to talk about it is, you know, is the fear of losing that. And so for me, my biggest driver in my life was basically, what can I do? What can I control with my own hands to be able to have this dog on this planet as long as possible? And how long is as long as possible? That's always been the greatest question. And so for me, when I was digging into research, trying to figure out how long can I be blessed to have this dog on the planet? It wasn't until I started digging Maria into like old literature. I'm talking old literature, like old literature, like what yeah. you're seeing here, eighth century BC before Christ. There, right there, is Odysseus and his dog Argos. And to see that animals, we have research and data that can tell us, even in stories and fables, that dogs could live to be in their 20s. And the story of Argos, yeah. who was in his 20s when his father came to her, uh, his father came back home. There was a lot of clues um, as, a, as a dedicated pet parent when you're researching out there to see that it wasn't that long ago when dogs had the ability to live to be in their 20s and 30s. And mm -hmm. today, we're, you know, we're hard pressed to see eight or nine or even 10 for that matter. Yeah. So I think that is probably my biggest driver today is, is knowing the fact that I refuse to lose the love of my life for things that I didn't research properly or knowing that the ability to have her to live so long is there in front of me and I didn't research it or I didn't find it because of my ignorance. Oh, yeah, that, that I totally connect with you. I had a set of surgeries with one of my dogs. But, um, I'd like, I'd like you to tell us, Rodney, what happened to you? I, I know you have some good news, but um, why don't you tell everyone what happened to Sammy? And, yeah, yeah. So, well, so Sammy, of course, uh, for, for, of course, the people that have followed along in my journey, um, my dog and, and, of course, the love of my life, as I say it a million times, uh, through a lot of mistakes and series that I made, um, I had performed a, a procedure called stem cell therapy in its early stages. Okay. And stem cell therapy can be, I believe in my heart, is something that could literally uh, be the future for, for therapies, but it's also a ticking time bomb. And it wasn't until I started traveling around the world talking to cancer researchers, um, understanding that if done incorrectly, you could literally put cancer inside your animal. And that was the mistake that I made many years ago was I was trying to fix my dog's knee who blew her knee. Um, and with that procedure, stem cell therapy here in my hometown, I went and visited my doctor. Um, and by accident, he spun a cancer cell and put it inside of her. And that is how we create cancer. And so I went on this journey. I was given a bad diagnosis and I went on this journey trying to figure out how I was going to stop the cancer in my dog. And today with all the beautiful scientists and the people that I met around the world, um, filming the cancer documentary, giving it back to the universe, giving people the information that they needed that I had, I had the ability to stop um, and reverse the cancer that was inside my dog. And oh literally, my God, that's yeah, amazing. it was, 
it was maybe for me the most empowering thing in the world to know that as a pet parent and as a as a human, if you have if you have children or or a loved one with cancer, that there are some non toxic tools tools and therapies that we can do at home um, that can really impact the growth of cancer. Okay, so that that is one of the. I'd say the most amazing and important things of your journey, Rodney, um, and the result, the aftermath of this effort and all the research you've done with other, like, um, other scientists in general. So um, what's the deal, Rodney, for everyone who is still feeding their dogs with cable? With, in Spanish, I'm gonna say with croquetas, okay? Well, croquetas, all the big yeah. croquetas, yeah. All the yeah. big brands. <laughs> all I need, big I'm gonna brands. learn that word, that's a great word, croquetas. croquetas. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's it, that's it. So basically, I, I just wanna give you a little intro of what uh, something that happens in Latin, in Latin America. In Latin America, most people feed cable, but in rural areas, which are many in Latin America, People don't feel cable. People have this intuition, this wise intuition. They don't know why, but they still feed with leftovers. Maybe it's not the most balanced diet, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. they give them leftovers. They let them um, let them grab maybe a rabbit, a chicken, whatever. You know. Yeah, so that's amazing. Say that. Yes, <laughs> I know. So it's amazing to see how um, we're shifting, you know, we're shifting as right. a society, as a society to, towards something that has always been there. So Rodney, what's the deal with people? What's the deal with it? Yeah, you know, and, and that's a, what a, you know, that just gave me goosebumps, right? To hear, you know, the rural parts of the world, the farmers of the world, the man with the oldest dog in the world, 31, who I got to interview, Brian McLaren, lived on a farm. Yeah. It's almost, you know, what's fascinating about the internet, it's almost better to have it and better to not have it and, and technology mm -hmm. at the same time because although the internet is the most powerful tool in the world to, to get information, um, those people that had no idea what was happening in cities and in suburbs fed their animals the way that their mother and their mother and their father fed their animals. That's right. Interestingly enough, the animals seem to live longer. And, you know, that, Maria, is like the biggest fascination in the world for me. So the kibble industry is a very interesting industry. And it is the perception of food today for today's generation. Imagine asking somebody today, like uh, Generation Z, for instance, what was the world like before the Internet? They don't know. My generation yeah. remembers when there was no internet and when the internet started, what it was like typing on your keyboard on like MS DOS to your next door neighbor and then ICQ and then MSN. And all <laughs> ICQ, yeah. I, ICQ? I love ICQ, right? But I do, yeah. All right, so there you go. You're a millennial, but ask Generation Z that question and they have no idea. And the reason why I bring that up is because that's what's happened to food. Our generation and the millennials and Generation uh, Z. They come from a they come from a culture where food is supposed to come into a bag. It's supposed to be formulated by somebody else. Um, the most obvious statement in the world, which that's my fascination with coming to Mexico and I'm going to Brazil to speak in Brazil and, and to go to these places where you don't really have to tell them very much that feeding something fresh would go a lot further than feeding something processed in a bag. The kibble Correct. industry is a was a very, very highly, highly marketed industry. Now look, 96% of the world population feeds, is it croquetas, as you said? So <laughs> yeah, croquetas, yeah, people, perfect. <laughs> there's a lot of people that feed kibble today, and that is because of the mass marketing and us as pet owners not knowing how to feed our pets. We think that there's going to be like, if there was a manual that could teach you how to feed your pet, maybe the world would see things a little differently. An electrician named James Spratt, who lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, one day made a trip to London. And he was sitting in London, and he was looking aside. And I have a picture here. I always have pictures. I always have props in everything I do. People are like, he always has props. Do you see that right there? That's a giant cracker. And they used to call that hardtack in the boats, like in the 1800s. And it was an old, old bread that 
it would be full of worms and nobody would eat. And so this electrician one day was walking by and he saw these people throwing out all these crackers, these big giant hard bread um, as garbage because they were full of worms. And he saw the dogs eating it. Now, the mm-hmm. debate was, were the dogs trying to eat the mealworms? Were the dogs eating because they were starving? I mean, they're sweet crackers, so maybe they were eating that. And he came up with this really good idea to take some of these crackers and to add a little bit of meat and vegetable to it. And he started the biggest marketing campaign in the history, Maria. They said that yeah. of all the marketers in the world, that James Spratt, the man that invented kibble, did the most marketing in the 20th century. In fact, he started the first billboard, you know, those big giant billboards that you see on the street. He put the first one up in the whole world to talk about pet food. And from that point going forward, the whole world started to slowly change because people started saying to themselves, wait a minute, maybe we don't know how to feed pets. Maybe an electrician who had a great idea Maybe that's the way to feed pets. And very slowly, the medical community got on board with it. And pet parents around the world started to become afraid that they were feeding their dogs incorrectly. And the birth of kibble happened. Now, I know you asked me a quick question, and I gave you a long version of how that happened. Perfect. But what's happened is it's become very convenient. It's become very affordable. Exactly. Um, It's hard to tell people who are on a budget to go and to buy all of these beautiful foods and start adding all of these fresh foods, let alone ourselves. I mean, look, I, I have, there's days I can't cook. And on those days that I can't cook, I, I've got a mother and a, a Mediterranean mother and grandmother who uh, we're lucky we'd be able to go to their houses. But that being said, uh, you know, there is boxed foods and packaged foods that we eat today as humans ourselves. Correct. That we, yeah. Yeah. That if you were to ask your grandmother, Maria, Hey, is this food, this box that I got from the shelf, she's going to slap you and say, are you crazy? Exactly. So I think totally, that's yeah. one of the biggest challenges and hurdles today that when we face with kibble um, is that we attack each other, first of all, when it comes to nutrition very quickly and we judge people. And that, I think, is the one biggest reason why we've never been able to communicate with, with each other is Correct. we'll never agree on nutrition. But one thing that we can agree on, and I truly believe it in my heart, is that Fresh food will always will always be better for you than processed food because you know how you feel. The problem is, is because we don't know how our animals, how they feel. We can't determine what's good from bad. And I believe when you ask me what's up with kibble, all of that rant that I just went on with, I think that we've lived in a world of not knowing. And now today, because of the digital revolution, we're figuring it out pretty quick and we are going to force the manufacturers to be better. And I am very excited to see the future of the pet food industry. I know. This is extremely exciting. And this topic goes beyond pets that are extremely important. But this goes to us as human beings, you know? Right. Like, right. as you said, we don't know what we're eating as consumers. We don't know what we're buying. So I'll leave this this topic for later because I want to ask you something else regarding food. So if if we have such a problem with kibble, Rodney, how should we be feeding? I'm sorry, how should we be feeding our dogs and cats and pets in general? I know you've talked about this many, many times. You have a lot of videos and yeah. and a lot of stuff, but many people don't know. So in general, in, 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 in a phrase, whatever, how can we feed correctly our dogs or, and cats and pets? Yeah, and that, that will be a question that we are going to ask for the next 500 years. Um, I would love to be the say the person that I'm the, that I'm the person that discovered the exact way and method of how we should all be eating. But one thing is for, for certain is that we have science and I am addicted to the information uh, that's out there when it comes to science and to studies. Um, I, on the weekend, I'm having dinner with scientists like this Saturday, I'm leaving to go have dinner. I love to hang around with science scientists. And I love when we have theories in our world and they co and they smash into the scientific world and things that we always seem to know we can validate through science. The biggest thing that I wanted to know was if I knew in my heart that putting something that came from the refrigerator, something that was alive and fresh into a bowl of kibble, if I knew in my heart that adding these foods uh, would be better for my pet, how was I able to validate that? And so 
to answer your question, what would be the best way to do something with all the studies that have come out, Maria, with traveling to Europe and to talking to the scientists in Europe, we know that if you just start with a teaspoon, just a teaspoon of the best of the ability of you can, whether it's a vegetable, whether it's meat, whether it's an egg, whatever it is, just a teaspoon has the ability to lower disease markers. That is probably the biggest, most impactful statement that the scientists and the researchers gave to me, that just 20% of something fresh and healthy into that bowl has the ability to affect your pet. From there, you start to work up, right? From there, you start to add as best as you can and with the money in your pocket and the ability that you have to add as much fresh food as possible. Look, we'll always... We'll always argue about what's the best way to feed a dog. I mean, go online right now. There's a huge issue with the vegans yeah. and the dog. Right. World, right. The vegans are coming in and the vegans are saying, look, we have a massive issue right now worldwide, globally. And we do 50, what is it? 150 billion animals a year that we slaughter. We've got like 50 billion pounds of waste. This is a human issue. And what happens is you have people that come out and saying, well, dogs can live forever being vegan. Dogs can live, and then you have the prey model people who say, no, dogs should only be eating meat, and that's it. Then you have, like, the barf community yeah. that comes in and say, no, dogs should be eating meat. But this is the same thing with humans. If we think for a second that any of us have it figured out, we've got rocks in our head because we still don't have it figured out for humans. We don't know if we should be eating yeah. the Mediterranean diet, the ketogenic diet, the high-carb diet, the low-carb diet, the paleo diet. All I can tell you is the, the nice thing about today today's day and age is now we have tools and technology that can show us what is happening in our bodies when we eat these foods. And so I would highly urge a lot of people out there today to start doing some of these tests. We can do microbiome tests on our animals. We can do blood marker validations. I think truly when you start to see past food, past the bowl, and look into what's happening metabolically to your animal, those are really the best tools and measurements we have today to see and to validate how we're feeding our pets. So to answer your question, that long-winded question, start with a teaspoon of something fresh. I love it, Rodney, I love it. Because there are so many people afraid to do it, to give them raw food. But I think an amazing way to start is by giving them Little testings, you know, right. of different foods, different fresh foods. Right. And um, this question, Rodney, takes me to another one, which is you've been doing a lot of exciting and amazing and uh, milestone <laughs> research on soft cancer. I'm so thrilled. Why don't you tell the world, Rodney, what you've been doing regarding this topic and uh, your cancer series and everything, and and some right. of the highlights you've you've um, encountered with, with this research? Yeah, you know, to to kind of touch a little bit on that last question and to move forward. Um, one thing that I can tell you, because you had just said it to me, Maria, people are very afraid. Um, we're told today that we can unbalance foods very easily. I was just sitting last week with two two epic world formulators, Steve Brown and, and Tammy Ackerman, and having conversations with these formulators about how much can a pet owner add into a diet? If they already have, let's say, a balanced diet, how much could they already add into a diet before they would start throwing things off? And, you know, the general perception is around 10 to 15 percent. In fact, if you want to even hike it up to 20, I think you would be fine uh, mm -hmm. if you're worried about unbalancing your food. So I just I wanted to put that out there because that's really important for people. I know the manufacturer will try to scare the shit out of you and tell yeah. you, hey, if you do anything to our food, you're going to unbalance it. Only feed our food and nothing I else. Know. Science is differently. And man, I got a lot of formulators as friends that can prove that. So um, don't worry about, you know, if you're adding just teaspoons, you're not going to unbalance anything. Now, that being said, uh, today, the excitement and uh, into cancer, into research, into longevity, um, we created a documentary, Dr. Karen Becker and I, traveling around the world, um, talking to the top scientists in the world about cancer. But cancer is just the tip of the iceberg. I think for me, the, my fascination still lies in longevity. And when you look at the research, longevity and cancer and disease, they're all kind of mushed together under the same thing, Maria. 
Um, today I have a huge fascination and I'm going to be hopefully adding this to some, maybe like a bonus package to the DVD. That's, uh, the, the dog cancer series is supposed to be released in April. I know we did a soft launch, but the official releases mm -hmm. in April. Yeah. Um, I have a huge yeah, fascination wait, no. with insulin and I've got a huge fascination with insulin because of all the studies that we have that are coming out today with insulin. I'll read this for the viewers that are out there, for the people that are interested in longevity. But what we know here, it says the reduction of insulin and IGF-1 um, significantly extend the lifespan in dogs and cats. And so they're doing a lot of longevity studies today, Maria. And what they're finding out is there's something in your body called IGF-1. And I'm really learning about IGF-1. And the more IGF-1 that we have in our body, um, the more that we're growing things, whether it's a tumor or whether it's aging your animal. So we're really okay. today uh, focusing very heavily, Dr. Becker and I, on um, talking to some of these researchers around the world. Hi, Jennifer. Talking to all these researchers around the world and asking these uh, researchers more questions about IGF-1. What can we do to shut down the insulin release um, in dogs and cats to extend life. And so that is really, um, is really what was driving us throughout this whole sort of mission on, on sort of, on eradicating or, or, or putting a dent in the cancer rates. And what's even more exciting today is that we're getting on a plane in a few weeks and we're going to Italy where we're going to talk and sit cool. down and break bread with the team of scientists and researchers down there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Biagio and his team who have evidence and scientific evidence to show that just your emotions, just your attitude, forget everything else, forget food, forget yeah. all of those things. What if you couldn't afford food? What if you had no money? Just your attitude and the way that you look at your animal or how you feel in your day, science can show you that just that has the ability, you can transfer your mood. So if you're a feel for, fear, uh, fearful person, you can transfer that fear onto your animal by just either your animal looking at you or smelling you. Mm -hmm. And then within three to five seconds, your animal will become exactly, will mimic exactly the emotions you have. And if you're fearful, fearful, if you're tough word for me today, if you're anxious, <laughs> you, are, you have the ability to raise your blood sugars, which raises your insulin. And so if you've got a dog with cancer, or you've got a dog with who seizures, or you've got a dog with any type of disease, your attitude through science can affect your animal. And I'm really excited to go to Italy and sit down with those scientists and get a lot of that information and bring you guys with me um, yeah. with, my, with my digital tools and make sure everyone gets it. <laughs> I love it, Ronnie. It sounds so, so interesting. And um, I, I wish you could tell us a little bit about um, how can we pet owners, you know, just regular people do to improve our dog's lives. You already said, okay, just add something fresh, you know, just yeah. start by, by doing that. Yeah. Um, people may maybe have dogs with certain diseases, right? right, right. Uh, probably with cancer. What, what would be your best advice to, to just regular people on yeah. what to do? So, you know, that's, that's a really loaded question. So, the reality is I, I do have my favorite supplements when it comes to diseases or even if you don't have diseases. My favorite supplement ever is omega-3 fatty acids. I can't stress to you the importance of omega-3 fatty acids because with the data and the science, when we went to Finland and we sat down and we talked to the researchers in Finland, they showed us on a study of 12,000 dogs, the dogs got omega-3, Maria, had the least amount of cancer. I just finished posting a study that cats with kidney, uh, who formed kidney stones, mm -hmm. that if you gave the cats omega-3 fatty acids, you had the ability to reverse kidney stones. Ooh, that's there funny. are articles out there swirling. And thank you to a lot of you who have sent me these articles that people are saying, don't eat sardines, sardines are toxic for you. Um, mm -hmm. Don't eat fish, fish is toxic for you. Don't eat this. Don't... Listen. You'll go online and there will be an article for every single food in the world and why you shouldn't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we can get lost in that very quickly. I'm not saying that there's no issues. And I know that there are people out there writing articles saying, don't give your dog, um, you know, whatever, fish or whatever. And usually they want to sell you something else. Um, mm -hmm. But as, as an educated, informed pet parent, you know, 
you want to think about sustainability, you want to think about the toxic oceans, but then you also want to think about, well, then I'm, I, if I was to read everything and everything, everything in this world was bad, then I can't give my pets absolutely anything. Yeah. So what I do, what I'll tell you to do is to go after science. At the end of the day, you have to follow the science. And if the science can show us that feeding omega-3 fatty acids, for instance, for cancer patients, for um, animals that are prone to certain diseases, for growing puppies, if you just put omega-3 fatty acids in a bowl for a growing puppy, it improves their brain by 99%, then do the best you can with the money you have to be able to supply your animal with omega-3 because the biggest problem, Maria, is those bags of pet food, they dry out very fast. And all the manufacturers will tell you they put omega-3 in the food, it dries out very fast. So, you know, when you – and there's a million other things, of course, I could su suggest. And I talk about omega-3s a lot. I talk about probiotics a lot. Yeah. Probiotics are very important. I sat down with some of the top scientists, Dr. Tim Spector, 1% of the most cited scientists in the world. Dogs and cats and people who had a diverse microbiome lived longer than any other animal in the world if their gut biome was more diverse. Meaning right. when they did a study on humans, the longest lived humans in the world had a diverse gut biome. Maggie. The 31-year-old dog from Australia drank raw milk twice a day. Do you know how many bacteria that's full of? And then she would eat placenta from a dead cow, and then she would go outside and eat uh, dirt. I know. Don't yeah. stop your dogs from eating dirt. Steve Brown, if you're watching, I was going to do a Facebook Live with Steve Brown, one of the world-leading formulators. I said, if you could pick one thing, Steve, this year, what would it be to feed your animal? He goes, let your animals eat dirt because <laughs> dirt is full of good bacteria. Now, of course – it has to be clean dirt. It has to be <laughs> not stuff made in a factory, sprayed with paint, not that type of dirt. Good, real, healthy, organic soil somewhere out in the woods untouched. Let your dogs eat dirt. So um, the microbiome is very important. So omega-3, if you can get good, clean fish, if you can't, look for a company that does third-party validation to make sure the omega-3 is clean. Don't let everybody out there scare you into buying their products because and try to scare you about feeding fish. There's a lot of tactics out there. Um, Follow the science is, is, is probably the best thing I can tell you. So I love those two things. I, I love I love the dirt thing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and uh, Rodney, <laughs> we just been hearing that this venture happened to you before. Have a, a problem with our veterinarians, you know? It's always right. a struggle, you know? You're even fearful. <laughs> like, I, I need to go to the vet. He's going to you know, blame me for everything because I raw feed my dog. So what would be your best advice to team to, on how to team up with our veterinarians instead of having a fight? Yeah. What would be the best thing for us to do? So, so your veterinarian, Maria, is your best friend. And your veterinarian should be your best friend. And when you were younger, it's a lot easier to pick a best friend because you sit beside them in class. You both share the same sneakers. You both got the same erasers on the tip of your pencils that look really cool, at least in Canada. That's what I thought was cool. But we have the ability to make connections when we are younger. And then as we get older, we get a little bit more standoffish. But your vet, like you would choose a best friend in elementary school, you should be choosing a vet that is your best friend. Mm -hmm. You should also... When you want to relay information, there's so many different ways. There's this beautiful TED Talk, by the way, and I don't know if it was on your page. I think you shared it about how people should be communicating with each other. And it yeah, was yeah, maybe. <laughs> an unbelievable, it was an unbelievable explanation on, you know, there's different tribes. And the vet community is people that go to school for a very long time, try to get information, uh, as much as information as they can in a short period of time. We want them to be dentists. We want them yeah. to be surgeons. We want them to be general practitioners. We want them to know if our dog tore his elbow or does it. We expect the veterinarian and we expect a lot of the veterinarian. Yeah. The one category that's been a hurdle for everybody in this world, not even just your veterinarian, is nutrition. Because even nutritionists today will fight and kill each other over nutrition. And the challenge is, is that the pet food manufacturer will hire nutritionists to come in and to talk to the veterinarian. So sadly, they only, and I talk to, I have a lot of veterinarian friends and a lot of young veterinarians that watch. And so, the biggest piece of advice that I can give a pet owner is I have people that I see on a daily basis that tell me my vet is my best friend. 
I can go in. I tell my vet that I'm feeding a raw food diet. I tell my vet that I don't want to over vaccinate. I tell my vet that I heard that spaying and neutering at a young age is an issue. There's new techniques out like ovary spare and vasectomies that could increase the lifespan of an animal. Again, that's in the science literature today. Yeah. So there's vets that are very open. There's people that are very open. There are people out there that say, I want to learn. There are yeah, vets yeah. that will graduate and say, okay, I read these really old books in school that were made in the 70s. And now I know everything. I know everything and I don't want to learn more. And then they go out into the work world and they get slammed by a pet owner. And the pet owner says, hey, man, I actually I was on last night researching all the brand new studies. Did you know this, 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 and this? And the vet's like, what's going on? So the communication between the pet owner and the veterinarian is very important. So I would ask all the pet owners to be kind, first and foremost. Be kind to your vet. Your vet loves your dog. Your vet loves you. I know that we look at vets and we say, oh, they're only in it for the money. And they only want to do this. You know, the highest rate of suicide, Maria, is amongst veterinarians. And we know worldwide that somebody's committing suicide every 40 seconds. So I would urge all of you beautiful pet owners out there that are watching this to be kind to your veterinarian. And it's only through kindness can we communicate with each other. Your vet has two concerns. One is that you're balancing the food properly. Because, yes, there are people out there who don't balance foods properly. There are people out there who will go buy like a box of chicken necks and feed it to their dog and cause yeah. nutritional deficiencies with that dog. There's a study that breeders were with Bernese Mountain Dogs out in Germany found diets online, fed these puppies these raw diets online, and these puppies grew up with terrible diseases and issues because they didn't grow up properly. So that's your vet's concern, and he should have that concern. You want your vet to be concerned about that. Some people are like, nah, I don't want to hear it anymore. I know more than you. The second thing that your vet's concerned about, of course, he learns in school about bacteria. Uh, Salmonella, yeah. E. coli, Listeria. <laughs> These are problems for humans. So your vet's concern is, okay, well, where are you getting your meat from? We know that in kibble, there's been more recalls for Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria, name the problem, in kibble, than there's been in any type of uh, raw food category in the world. Right? That's correct. So we know that there's research there and your vet is very open to it. He just wants to make sure that you're balancing your food properly so you don't hurt your pet and they can live a long time. Now, if you've got a shady salesman, because yes, sadly, some vets are on commission. So you walk in and they're like, hey, look at this label of this box here. Hey, do you <laughs> want to vaccinate your dog? Hey, can I put this flea or ticks? Walk, walk, get out run for the door <laughs> and find another veterinarian. Um, but they're very rare. And to find, and there's not very many of those vets out there today, but you can't classify one bad vet as all bad vets because there's plumbers like that. There's electricians yeah. like that. There's, you, you just can't. It's not fair. And so I think the biggest thing that I, that I, the biggest piece of advice today that I would give the pet owner is to be kind and find a vet that is very receptive to research. I, when we made those cancer DVDs, we made one to give it to your vet. Your warning sign, if you walk in with a $300 DVD package and give it to your vet, and he's like, I'm not interested, walk. Your vet should be like, hey, thank you so much. Um, super busy, but I will find the time to watch this because you are my client, your dog. I am your partner. I am your teammate. And if it's it team means that much to you, then it means that much to me. And I promise you, when both people start communicating like that, we all win and dogs will live a really long time. I, I love this message because um, it's really better to team up than to divide, right? Uh, we'll, we'll achieve more as a society Absolutely. if we team up. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, Rodney, one more thing I, I'd like to, to ask you. Um, there are some comments that people from my community in Spanish want to, um, they, they want to ask you stuff, right? So I, yes. I chose a few because there were so many so many questions but one of them is from Ele Fortuna which is she's asking what exactly are vegetable fats and oils for dogs and if a healthy young dog has a raw feed diet should I switch to keto um, we haven't you know introduced ourselves to the yeah. keto thing but yeah. if you could just give us a little intro yeah. So the keto diet is is a new is a very new sort of fad right now. Uh, reality is when I when we were filming the documentary, Dr. Karen Becker and I, we were interested more in the ketogenic state, the metabolic mm -hmm. 
state that you're in. I know now that people are selling every, just this morning. I just, somebody sent me a link to um, this new keto kibble that's coming out and there's like keto uh, sauce that you can pour on your okay. food. <laughs> I do want to stress this. Of course, every time something or we hear something, somebody always, Oh, I got a $10 million idea and somebody wants to make money. First and foremost, if you are doing any research on ketogenic diets, you want to be very careful that you do not introduce that to a puppy. What is a ketogenic diet? High fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrates. That is the ketogenic diet. But reality is you could put yourself in a state of ketosis just eating chocolate cake, Maria. If you only eat chocolate cake twice a week and you fasted for five days of the week, you're going to be in ketosis. Okay. There really is no diet that can get you into ketosis unless you're measuring your blood markers and things like that. So you want to get into what's called a ketogenic state. Now there are some diets that of course can make it easier, but for puppies, I've been seeing, I've been seeing a lot of people out there posting photos of them feeding a puppy a ketogenic diet. And I hardly urge the people out there do not do that. Why? Because you need a lot of protein for that puppy. That puppy needs those amino acids. So to answer your, your audience's question, don't feed a ketogenic diet to a puppy. That's a bad idea. What the, keto the ketogenic diet is supposed to do is it's supposed to simulate fasting. And what yeah. we know, Maria, is it's almost like an anti-aging, anti-inflammatory um, state that you want to be in after you're done fully growing. So even so, when researchers did ketogenic diets on puppies and on young children, there was really no effect until they got the people were like 25 and older, or the puppies were like four years old and older and then became adult dogs. So uh, do not put those puppies in keto, unless God forbid, you got a, a puppy with leukemia and you're in a really bad situation. That's another story. To address the fats, fats are beautiful. According to Steve Brown, the world leading formulator, I brought him up three times. Your dog is the fat she eats, meaning <laughs> The fat is what, you know, when people go on a raw food diet, the first thing that they say is, my God, my dog's fur is so soft. I can yeah. touch my dog. That's because of the fat. And a lot of people don't realize that. What happens is fat becomes your primary source of energy for your animal. And so to answer your user's questions about good fats, I'm a, you know, the best fat in the world, of course, for an animal would be animal fat. But you really want to make sure that you're getting good, clean source of animal fat. And you want to also make sure it's not heated fat. Because what Keto Pets, the ground baking sanctuary that did all the research and the science showed, was that when you add heat to the fat, it causes pancreatitis because you damage the fat. So for a lot of these people um, who are looking for high fat kibble diets, be careful. Um, those fats are usually heated and will actually cause a lot of issues. Um, I love... Uh, I love plant fats and I love stable plant fats. Okay. And by plant fats, let me explain that. I love coconut oil. I love coconut oil because it's a medium chain triglyceride. It doesn't affect the pancreas. So if you've got a dog with pancreatic cancer, it's a great fat to go around and to hover around. So if you can, and it's shelf stable, it doesn't go rancid. If you add a lot of fat to a diet that could be rancid fat, you could cause some harm for your animal. So okay. that is one of the plant-based uh, fats that I do like. I do love, um, but I do really love animal fats if I can get like good fish, good mm -hmm. fish sources of fat. Remember, we're going to Italy to visit Sardinia, the longest lived people in the world with the centurions from Sardinia. Yeah. Who all live over 100 and they're all on high fat. A lot of them eat pescatarian diets, high fish diets because of the good fat from fish. So if you got good fish, that is one of the best sort of sources of fat that you can add into your dog's ball and cat. Anything else uh, regarding... Uh, veggie fat? Or so I don't, I'm not a huge fan of, there's certain vegetables that I'd like to stay away from. So like corn oil, yeah. I'm not a big fan of corn oil, safflower oil, things that could be very high in omega-6, Maria, that could cause inflammation. Dogs already have a high omega-6 diet. There's no omega-6 in coconut oil. There's a lot of misconception that people think there is. There's no omega-3 either. Um, coconut oil is a medium chain triglyceride, but there's a lot of plant oils that are high in omega-6. I like flax oil, but mm -hmm. remember, a lot of people think that dogs can convert and cats can convert the linoleic acid in flax into DHA and they can't. Dogs and cats have a hard time breaking down plant-based oils to turn them into omega-3. 
They're just the good Lord didn't design them to be able to do that. So if I'm using a plant based oil as just a source of fat and it's shelf stable, it's one thing. If I'm trying to use it for omega three or any benefits, I'm not a huge fan. Avocados, I know avocados are a really good clean source of fat. Avocados are very controversial because of the skin yeah. and because right. of the pit. But when you make a lot of these oils, if you pick up and you contact the manufacturer, they're not using the skin or the pit in their oils. They're just using the flesh. And the today, flesh, half yeah. Of the, yeah, and half of the pet foods today all have avocado in it. If you flip around the back of the fat, it's good and it's a clean fat as well. Okay, yeah, we 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 have a lot of avocado here in Mexico, so it's it's one of the questions that I got the most. Um, Rodney, one more question from sure. our audience, which is, you know, Mexico is home of the Sholo dog, right? Did you watch Coco, the movie? My God, no, but I feel like I have to now. Oh my God, you have to totally. <laughs> Before okay, I come down know, there, I got to watch it. <laughs> I know. It, okay, so, you know, Sholo, Sholo Squinkler dogs, they're originally from Mexico, the hairless dogs. Okay. So uh, I have a question from one of her pet parents that is oh, wow, what do you recommend fun. me best <laughs> for a show low since they have no fur oh wow <laughs> <laughs> what's the best of it well here's the thing <laughs> <laughs> i honestly to answer that question in all fairness for me what i come to realize whether the dog has fur whether the dog doesn't have fur um why is it that smaller dogs live longer than older dogs. Now, I sat down with a lot of scientists who have answered that question. The one piece of advice I, that I can give to the community of the hairless dogs or the communities around the world that do have dogs with hair on them and for humans yeah. is watch your calories. What science is telling us today is that there's a certain level of calories that you're not supposed to go past in the run of a day. And when you do go past those calories, whether you have a dog with hair or no hair, you start to release something. Your pituitary gland will start to release something called IGF-1 combined with your liver. Remember what we were talking about earlier, it's a growth factor. It starts to grow things in your body. So the scientists have done a lot of study into foods for animals. And what they found out in a lot of these studies, and I know that Purina was one of these people that did the studies, was the least food that you gave to the dog. The less food that you gave to a cat, I'm not talking about starving your animals. I'm just talking about the least that you feed them, the longer that they live. The people around the world in Africa and in China that are thin and tiny and frail, but live to be 130 are not eating all the time. And they're not constantly putting food in their mouth. And so science is showing today that if you could eat once a day and you could fast for 18 hours, that you will increase the longevity of your dog. So for these people that ask these questions, you know, hey, what is the best thing? What is the best piece of advice that you can give me for my dog? Now, whether the dog has no hair on it or not, would be the <laughs> fact that I would tell everybody, and I've said this in every single one of my podcasts, is to buy a glucometer. And okay. buy a glucometer. I mean, I have one of these things on hand all the time because I always want to know what my blood sugars are. But I measure my dog's blood sugars as well. And what I tell everybody, these things are about eight bucks. You can buy them for 40 bucks. You can buy them more expensive. Is these, cool. yeah. these little kits that you can go and you can buy. They're very cheap. And what these do, Maria, is they tell you how high your blood sugars are. And then what you can validate is that you know sometimes that if your blood sugars, not sometimes, the majority of the time is when your blood sugars are very high, you're producing a lot of insulin. The best thing you can do is go to your vet and do an insulin test. And what that means is, is that you're aging your dog faster and you're aging yourself faster. And that dog that you love and you want that dog to spend the majority of its life with you, you've got to watch the calories. And the problem in America, the problem worldwide is we love dogs. I love dogs. I give my dogs treats. So much because I love them so much that I don't realize that I'm exceeding the calories. So one of the tips that I tell people is take a cup and put that cup there on your kitchen cabinet or your kitchen counter. And when you give your dog a treat, put a treat in the cup. And when you feed your dog, put some food in that cup. Watch how high that cup gets to because I promise the more that you feed the dog, the less the dog is going to live. And when they did the studies, that Purina study, they would take two bowls of kibble and they would put 35% less kibble in this or 25%, whatever the study was. And this one, the dog could eat as much as it wants. And the dogs that hardly ate lived the longest. So food, although it nurtures you and it feeds you, 
it speeds up your aging and can ultimately kill you. No matter what the food is, it could be the best food in the world, you can still overdo it. Right. Thank you so much, Rodney, for answering all these questions. I just want to close this amazing time for you by saying that this uh, powerful movement you've started, along with Dr. Karen Becker, that we hope to meet soon. Um, by the way, everyone in the world, Rodney Habib is coming to Mexico City on April 21st to so our TEDx event. So yeah, cross your fingers so we can have another surprise along. <laughs> so um, we're very happy about this. But the thing is, you've started a really amazing movement. As I said, this goes beyond um, pets. This goes to us as consumers. Uh, Human rights, man, it's, it's, it's really, really important. We need to be um, critical and we need to do research and educate ourselves on what we're consuming. And what's the best thing to do? As you said, there are no like consensus in every topic, especially diet, but we certainly can do better. And we certainly have to do better for pets, for dogs, cats, and other animals. So my last question would be, how can we help you, Rodney? How can we pet owners um, do to help this cause? Yeah, so, you know, I think I think first and foremost is we have to be kind to each other and we have to understand that we want to be in a world where those animals that we love with all of our hearts will be with us for as long as possible. Nobody, nobody, nobody brings a dog into their life in hopes of that dog going and looking forward to the next dog. And so as pet owners, it's very important for us to support each other to be able to send research. If we don't agree with what we think from one another, there's polite ways to message that person on the side and say, hey, look, I saw that you thought about this, but what do you think about that? I think today we're very quick to attack. I know this question was yeah. about me, but I wanna make this question about everybody. If, you know, I've had people do this to me myself that are my own friends that will call you out online in front of everybody and go in in the little comment box and be like, oh, well, you're wrong and here's why I think you're wrong. I think those people are not going to make it very far in life trying to communicate when we attack each other on, on global platforms the way that we do. I think there's a polite way of talking to each other. For myself, yes. If there, I know saying that, that last week I did a Facebook Live addressing some of the uh, veterinary nutritionists in the pet world. And I think for me, if the information is not only false, but if the information can actually hurt animals, then yes, yeah, we should stand up and we should do something. And, and I think there's polite ways. I've reached out to these people in the past, but what I want to do for us and what I think we need as a, in my humble opinion, is we need a World Health Organization for pets. And so ultimately, as you know, I'm traveling around the world. Dr. Becker and I were traveling around the world. We're trying to raise $120 million to build this for the people. So yeah. the people then if they need a place to go and they have no money or their dog has cancer or they need research or whatever it is they need, if they need help, um, it's a place and help support for the people built by the people. So the best thing that people can do for me, first and foremost, is to be kind to each other. I mean, I think, I think, we'll, I think we'll all win and the dogs will win. And the second thing that I would ask of people is just to research. And if you like the information that we're bringing you from the scientists, I don't have to tell people to share it because I know they are. I don't have to tell people to like it because I know they do. I am blessed by the pet owners around the world. They, We are a community together um, that's growing together, that we're learning together. We're connecting like this. We're coming to Mexico to do a TED Talk in Mexico Yay. because of awesome people like yourself that have put that together. So we're supporting each other and we're bringing this information to be able to teach each other and grow from each other. I don't know everything. I'm learning from scientists who tell me and those scientists don't know everything they're learning. We're constantly learning, we're constantly growing. And if you think you know it all, I wouldn't sit, I, I don't have time for people like that. I love people that are experts, but I even the experts will tell you they don't know it all. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. And that is a very, very beautiful message uh, from you, Rodney. I really want to thank you for making the time for um, 
overcoming the tech stuff with me. <laughs> you bear with me. Good. <laughs> We're very excited to have you here um, on April, Rodney. And um, this is very important for us. You know, um, our, our region in Latin America faces many, many problems, politics, economics, whatever, many things. But one, one thing we do have is the desire for a better world and the desire for, for, for justice and justice for animals too. People are very eager to learn, and I'm sure your your journey in Mexico will be a really amazing milestone here for dogs, for human beings. So I, I really, really am your biggest fan, along with our the community. Like um, people in Spanish were, oh my God, really? I need to go up because Rodney is gonna be on, on the screen, whatever. So. Um, Really, I, I really thank you. I really thank your fans, you know, all the people that, that were here with us. Um, and I really hope we can do this again later on. Um, and thank you so much. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add. Well, I'm just, I'm going to be working on my Spanish. I'm, I'm okay. very secretly convincing Dr. Karen Becker to come with me to this. I know there's a lot of people that I've been speaking to over the weekend that want to attend, that want to come down to this, uh, to this big talk in Mexico. I hope that, I know that people, I'm very excited that you guys invited me. I know globally we're going to hopefully reach as many people as we can with this. And I'm working on my Spanish. I want to have my Spanish perfect so I can come up and put a couple lines together. Um, <laughs> and, does you know that one. And thank you to the people <laughs> in uh, in all the countries around the world watching this right now. Um, like I said, I'm just very excited to be able to connect with people, and and I look and I look forward to coming to Mexico. And hello to everybody in Mexico, and uh, we'll see you soon. Cool. Thank you, everyone, again. Thank you, Rodney. I, I really invite you, everyone who doesn't raw feed their dogs, just do your research, follow Rodney Habib, and try just a little bit of raw food, maybe a raw bone, whatever. That'll make a difference. So thank you for, for being with us. See you next time. Bye.